So thanks very much for sticking with us after lunch. Uh, I think we had a, a great lunch with uh, Secretary, Assistant Secretary Jacobson. And we're now going to get started with our, our next panel. The, the title of the panel is Customs and Logistics Strategies for Efficient Border Management. Uh, in some ways, the, the concept here is we've already spoken about infrastructure. Uh, it's clear that there are infrastructure needs at the U.S.-Mexico border uh, across actually a variety of, of sectors, if, from energy to actual transportation and port of entry infrastructure. But it can't be just about building more lanes. It can't be just about uh, building more bridges, adding more ports of entry. Uh, it also obviously has to be about how we manage those ports of entry, how we manage them in a way that's efficient, that works for both the business that happens on the U.S.-Mexico border as well as the day-to-day -day traffic across the U.S.-Mexico border, people going to school, going to work, going to visit their family. Uh, so this is all a piece of it. A big piece of that, of course, is, is customs is on the commercial side. How we actually gather information from companies who are importing and exporting, process that information, ensure that the cargo is secure, uh, that it is what they say it is, uh, and part of that is, is building relationships. And so that's why we're really happy to have here both representatives from government and from the private sector. Uh, we're going to be thinking about the ports of entries themselves, uh, the, the customs processes, and, and really thinking that it, of course, has to go beyond that because we're talking about whole supply chains. We're talking about supply chains that start thousands of miles away from from the border oftentimes, and if we don't have that whole supply chain functioning well, we're not going to be able to have a border crossing that functions well. So we're trying to put a lot of those concepts together, and to do that, we're very fortunate because we have people that will actually, I think, be up for, the, up for that challenge. It's quite a big challenge, but I think we do have the, the right people in the room. Uh, immediately to my left, to your right, is Charles Stallworth. He's the Assistant Commissioner for International Affairs at US CBP, Customs and Border Protection. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read the whole bios just because you have them in front of you, uh, but, but just so you're clear, uh, he has a, a long history of doing this. I just had a great conversation with him outside uh, where he brought in my scope from thinking about the U.S.-Mexico border and customs between our two borders to, the, to convincing me that I need to be considering how we manage the entire world's custom systems if we want to make the U.S.-Mexico border function at, at its uh, full potential. Uh, Further to, to my left and to your right is Jose Martin Garcia. Uh, he's from the, the, the representative of Mexican uh, Tax Administration, uh, the SAT, uh, as well as the, the Treasury here in Washington, D.C. Likewise, he's been at this for quite a long time, uh, going back to the days of, of NAFTA and the Customs subgroup there. Uh, and, and he will you know, be able to tell us about the Mexican side. A lot of the things that we're going to hear about are actually bilateral in nature or multilateral in nature. Uh, but the Mexican side of that, and of course, Mexico's also passed a customs reform recently, so there's a domestic front to, to some of this uh, as well. And finally, last but, but definitely not least, Miguel Perez from Ryder. Uh, he is the one who will be able to take us in some ways you know, way beyond the border because it's his job to do the, the logistics uh, for shipments that do cross borders, but also incorporate you know, thousands of miles of journeys on both sides of the border. So I'm just going to jump right in. I hope that's OK with you all. Uh, please be assured that these people are, are more than qualified to, to represent the, the perspectives that they're representing here today. And so I'm going to begin immediately to my side. Mr. Stallworth, take it away. Thank you very much, Chris, um, and uh, good afternoon to everyone out there. It's a pleasure to be with you and participate in this panel, um, uh, and especially to be here with my good friend uh, Jose Martin, uh, who I've known for almost every all the years that I've been in uh, in U.S. Customs, uh, and now Customs and Border Protection, uh, and also with Miguel Perez Perez, uh, who is also a great partner and a stakeholder of CBP. Uh, I would like to thank the Wilson Center for uh, the opportunity to speak to you today. Hopefully, you are all able to listen to our commissioner, uh, Mr. Gil Kurlikowski, uh, during the previous segment. Uh, during his presentation, he laid out a very good panorama of the many things that CBP uh, is working on in the macro view. We are all very excited about the many uh, business transformation initiatives uh, that are underway and will make significant difference in how we handle all aspects of our mission at CBP, especially the efficient flow of people and goods across our borders. It's no secret uh, to this group that our relationship with Mexico is very strong and continues to grow stronger. Twenty years of NAFTA 
experience have served to truly cement the interdependence and mutually beneficial relationships uh, that we enjoy. This successful relationship has, however, brought that, that booming business to an already congested and, in many cases, outdated border crossing system. Fortunately, the relationship with the government of Mexico and their drive for innovation and progress have enabled us to work together towards some very promising projects that have already benefited uh, many of those who use the border. I would like to highlight just a couple of those initiatives. First of all, wait time measurement and active lane management. Over the past several years, we have been diligently working with our partners in Mexico and in Canada to implement various methods to measure and report wait times at border crossings along both the northern and southern borders. This technology has enabled us to have more transparent methodologies and tools to help border crossers make decisions regarding the times to cross and in some cases, even what borders, what specific crossings to use. Aside from the wait time measurement technology, CBP has implemented a number of technology innovations to better segment traffic coming into the United States. The use of radio frequency identification, or RFID, enabled documents has made a key piece of being able to maximize the use of some of our business transformation efforts in the land vehicle environment. Being able to segregate the traffic between trusted travelers and other travelers was the initial benefit that clearly offered a way for these trusted travelers to move quickly through the border, leaving CBP the opportunity to focus more on the other travelers. New technology of the new technology of Western Hemisphere Travel Initiative, or WIDI, compliant documents that incorporate RFID chips has provided an opportunity to use technology to reduce the need for manual inputs by our officers at crossings. This effort significantly reduces time and increases the quality of the inspections at the border. CBP continues to look at even greater innovations regarding self-input kiosks that allow travelers to spend some of their time in, in line processing their entry requirements using kiosks, allowing the officers to focus on the interview of the travelers rather than the administrative process. These pilots are in various forms of trial at pedestrian areas and at select airport terminals, and we hope to see more benefits from these pilots to transform the border crossing experience. This has been especially true when we look at some of the airports like DFW that install some of these uh, kiosks uh, that actually reduced wait times by 40 percent, an unexpected benefit by those who are, were in charge. One of the commercial pilot programs we are working on with the government of Mexico is the quote unquote front of the line privileges pilot, where we will look for additional opportunities to segregate the lanes for trusted traders as far in advance as customs primary lanes to ensure that trusted traders get benefits, that's expedited uh, processing, through the entire process. For example, uh, the, the NEC that the boss talked about a little bit earlier, and that's the CTPAT equivalent of, um, of secure uh, trade uh, lanes, or FAST, uh, which is an importer uh, expedited uh, release uh, truck can have a dedicated approach to a lane in Mexican customs, then receives front of the line pr privileges throughout the Mexican customs process, and then has the access to a dedicated lane upon arrival in U.S. customs and any front of the line privileges throughout the U.S. customs process. This will ensure that trusted traders receive every facilitative benefit that they can throughout the entire crossing process. They are also in the planning, we are also in the planning phase with SAT for similar process for traders leaving the U.S. entering Mexico. And the next step from that would be uh, a single border, single inspection, depending on what direction you're coming in, where either Mexico or the U.S. does the inspection and you get the benefits at the other border or uh, as you cross the border. So inspect once, 
crossed the border twice. The North America Cooperation. As you may be aware, the North American leaders met in February of this year and have established some very clear goals for all of us to work on, on efforts to harmonize our processes and programs to ensure increased competitiveness of the region. Some of the specific efforts will include harmonizing our advanced data requirements, attaining mutual recognition for trusted trader and trusted traveler programs among the three countries that includes Canada. This includes extending benefits from these programs to members of their respective programs. These efforts will help to bring about greater transparency and predictability in travel and trade. Through this concept of transparency and predictability, the uncertainty and cost of doing business in our region is decreased. This will continue to make our region more economically competitive. Another important body of work involves the trilateral efforts to develop a single window in each country, with longer term goals of having those single windows to be interoperable. Jose Martin Garcia next to me is rightfully proud of the progress that Mexico has made in implementing their single window. The U.S. is making significant strides in the development of our single window and we have gained significant momentum following President Obama's executive order mandating that the U.S. government agencies participate in the single window hosted by CBP. In line with the single window developments, we also have the Office of Trade leading CBP's engagement in the Border Interagency Executive Council, which includes many regulatory agencies that have authority over certain types of goods that cross our borders. This effort is yielding unprecedented communication and collaboration between the U.S. government agencies, especially as we all review our regulatory processes and ensure that we are in line with the needs of a global marketplace and the efforts towards automation and harmonization under a single window concept. We have also recently begun some exciting discussions with Mexican regulatory agencies such as Sagarpa and Senecia, Sene, uh, Sica, yeah, okay, who are very interested in exploring ways to implement risk management strategies into our cross-border traffic. This is a great opportunity that we hope to be able to share more details on as we discuss and potential projects are better defined. In summary, we have already, uh, we have uh, many ongoing projects with Mexico and with our Canadian colleagues uh, that have already resulted in reduced processing times at the borders, innovative new pilots being implemented, or in the developmental stages that will continue to transform the way we view and handle global trade in North America. And in some respects, because of the significant influence that each of the North American countries enjoys in various markets, we have the opportunity to influence the other regions in harmonizing some trade and customs practices that can bring truly global nature uh, the, bring the truly global nature of our economies into the 21st century that the private sector already operates under. Thank you for your attention and for allowing me to participate in this panel. Thanks very much. <laughs> Jose Martin, the floor is yours. Oh, and actually, so we have a presentation, so maybe we can scoot off to the side just a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the uh, Wilson Center, to ProMexico and BTA for the invitation. This is always a good opportunity to spread the word about things that we're doing. Um, although when, when we talk about customs and taxation, I, I always tell my friends that I feel like I'm Elizabeth Taylor in her seventh uh, wedding wedding night. <laughs> I know exactly what I have to do, but the challenge is how to turn this into a moment of pleasure. <laughs> so I will try to do that, all right? I have 12 minutes, no? All right. 12 minutes of pleasure. Well, the, the thing is this. Um, I guess Ambassador Mina Mora this afternoon said something very important. When we talk about competitiveness, we talk about reduction of transactional costs. 
That's basically point number one. And if we don't achieve point number one, we're not achieving anything. So um, when we talk about reforms and changes, we have to keep that in mind, keep that goal in mind. We have to reduce transactional costs. Um, in, in Mexico, everybody, or well, around the world, everybody talks about Mexico's energy reform and the educational reform and the political reform and other reforms. I'm the guy in the room, back in the room, that always raises his hand, talk about the cost of reform, talk about the cost of reform. We did a big, deep, uh, we passed a, a deep customs reform last year in Mexico, a watershed and in, in a real game changer of thing, things are going to change at the border because of this reform and some other things. So to talk about transactional cost reductions, and here you have a government official that comes to you to tell that we're going to reduce cost. Uh, well, let me show you how are we actually reducing costs at the border. So I'm, I'm going to talk about three recent developments. One, single window. Two, customs and tax reforms. And three, our customs initiatives, bilateral customs initiatives. Uh, let me start with single window. Uh, since 2011, we have a single window in Mexico. We launched it, and it's fully operational since 2012. In Mexico, by law, we don't use paper for imports and export. Uh, we started in 91, actually. We began using these floppy disks, so our customs brokers brought the floppy disks, uh, the customs declaration there. So we have moved since 91 until today to a single window environment. How do we do that? Well, in Mexico also, taxpayers file their tax returns electronically. We don't accept uh, uh, re tax returns on paper anymore because all of our tax, all, uh, all of our importers, exporters, and all the taxpayers they have, they have a, an electronic signature. So having an electronic environment in customs and having an electronic signature allowed us or positioned Mexico or customs uh, at a level where we could develop this. We worked with all the other agencies. We uniformed the process. And today, by law, all imports and exports in Mexico are done through a single window system. That has a lot of benefits, in addition to reducing costs. Uh, of course, it encourages competitiveness, it eliminates paper. Actually, in SAT, we publicize in, in TV commercials in Mexico and everywhere uh, about how many gallons of water are we, we are saving every day, how many uh, pages, how many uh, uh, sheets of paper we're saving, saving every day. So we move for a, to a completely uh, automated environment. We, of course, uh, reduce uh, this time-consuming process. Uh, we, we work very closely with the customs brokers in developing these, and, and, and thanks to their support, we reached uh, all this level in, in making all, also uh, data available uh, prior to the shipment's arrival to the port. We have more data now than, than we thought 10 years ago. And we also facilitate the access to information from remote locations. We are in this process where importers and exporters will be able next year to file their, in, their uh, customs entries uh, from their tablets. Um, we are reducing transactional costs by including, uh, by re uh, reducing um, transaction um, uh, physical inspection spaces or physical locations to store uh, documents. And it also increases integrity because at the same time, importers and exporters, they don't have to go window by window to the agricultural department or the health department or other departments requesting uh, their permit for import or export. Everything is done automatically. Each agency knows uh, their importers and exporters, and they authorize automatically uh, the importation or exportation of, of such goods. Our single window is also consistent with the World Customs Organization and APEC uh, models. So that's number one, reduction of costs, of transactional costs through a, window, a single window system. Number two, the customs and tax reforms. Uh, well, uh, we had to provide legal certainty because we had automated all our processes. And some of these processes or procedures were at, let's say, um, the memo level level or the, uh, let's say, a guidance or guideline level, not at the regulatory level. So we had to uh, incorporate all these changes that we've been implementing in recent years to the level of the law. And that include, of course, the single window process. Uh, 
in something that is, uh, it's been uh, praised by the private sector all over North America, which is the uh, making, making it optional to use a customs broker or a, uh, or a customs legal representative. That will start in, in, on January 1st, 2015. Uh, that means that b until today, companies or importers or exporters are obliged to use uh, a customs broker for the services, which 99.9% .9 of customs brokers provide an excellent and professional service. So it will be now up to the companies to keep using the broker or, or designate another uh, customs legal representative. Uh, we are expanding the uh, post-import corrections. Uh, we, are, we have eliminated already the third-party inspection. In Mexico, uh, until last year, a, a shipment came to the border if it was selected for secondary inspection. It may get another inspection after that one as a quality control mechanism, uh, and uh, that has been eliminated already. Uh, the non-intrusive non inspection process, I'm not 100% sure. This is the X-ray and gamma ray systems where the containers or trains or trucks pass through and we look at the images of what's inside of that truck or that container. Well, these non-intrusive inspection uh, equipment, I guess Mexico Customs, I'm not 100% sure, but I think we are the customs agency that has, that has more non-intrusive inspection equipment per container in the world. So in, with these changes in, in the processes, we had to uh, incorporate them into the, uh, our, our customs laws and procedures. Now, most of the shipments, before moving to a physical inspection of the cargo, we do a non-intrusive inspection, uh, inspection first, and then we, uh, if, if, it's ne if needed, we pass to, uh, we move the truck or the container to an area where we can do a physical inspection. Um, we also amended our, our regulations on strategic bonded warehouses and facilities. They don't need to be adjacent to our ports of entry anymore. They can be located anywhere in the country. And uh, one big one was the, uh, to uniform our value at tax rate. We had two different va uh, value at tax rates in the country, 16% uh, inside the country and 11% at the border strip. Having one value at tax rate, a uniform tax rate, allowed us then to eliminate all these checkpoints at the exit of the, of the border strip. So I don't know if you were aware of this, but trucks had to stop at the border line and they maybe stop again at the checkpoint because we had to confirm electronically, of course, but we had to confirm that that 5% difference had been already paid. So if all these things are reducing costs everywhere in the process. Now about our uh, bilateral initiatives, um, uh, Charlie already mentioned uh, some of them, uh, but uh, let me focus on uh, our attention in a couple of them, or three of them. First one, cargo pre-inspection pilots. We are, uh, we are working on a cargo pre-inspection pilot at the uh, Laredo, Texas airport. We already have SAT personnel working there at the Laredo, Texas airport on the US side, uh, testing with our colleagues from CBP these air uh, cargo shipments to eight Mexican airports uh, so that when it's uh, implemented or when it's full, formally launched, we will have the capacity then to inspect cargo on the U.S. side, and when the ship, shipment arrives to these airports in Mexico, they will not uh, be uh, touched. Um, there are other two projects on the Mexican side for uh, having our colleagues from CVP working with us. Uh, one is at uh, Enotai, and the other one is in Juarez, or in San Jerónimo, Chihuahua, in, uh, in Otay for um, agriculture uh, products or from Mexico to the U.S. Uh, we plan to start these pilot uh, processing around 225 trucks per day. And on um, San Jerónimo, Chihuahua, uh, we're uh, working with Foxconn. Just uh, uh, for those of you who were this morning here and saw um, Ivan Jaime's uh, presentation on, uh, on the project on Santa Teresa, well, just across the border, the image didn't show that, what Ivan showed this morning, but just across the border, there's uh, a Mexican port of entry, and of course there's uh, these uh, Foxconn facilities where they produce around between 40,000 and 50,000 computers per day. And uh, we are planning to have also a cargo pre-inspection pilot there with our colleagues from CBP. So when the shipment left, leaves the, uh, the uh, or the shipments leave the uh, facilities, they will enter the U.S. Um, uh, without being inspected, only if necessary. Um, 
this the, the the next two single rail truck and air and maritime manifests these are the um the jewels of the crown let's say for 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 north america's uh trade everybody's asking to have a single uniform customs declaration in north america well i've just returned last night from guadalajara and we had meetings with ferromex we finalized the northbound rail single rail manifest today i can proudly say and very happily say that we have a single northbound rail uh, manifest uh, um, in place, working with, with Ferromex. We are replicating these. We will be replicating these throughout the, uh, the, the border. Rail is very important. Something that hasn't been mentioned these days is that uh, before Mexico privatized railroad, uh, we, just, we used to uh, trade just 1% of our bilateral trade on rail. That was about 16 years, 16 years ago, 17 years ago. Today, it's 17%. In, in just 16 years, 17%. Uh, now. We're, let's say, we're projecting that in about 10 years, 12 years, we'll reach 30%. The same percentage that uh, the US-Canada trade has. We're heading towards a North American way of moving cargo. And, Taking care of rail now, it's, it's, it's a good option for everything that has been said about rail this morning. So uh, we have a single <laughs> rail manifest, northbound manifest. We are beginning to work on the southbound rail manifest in our working group, just starting the discussions to have a single truck manifest. And we'll be talking to uh, the American Trucking Associations and other groups, and we will involve them in this process. Uh, for air and maritime, our uh, uh, manifests are basically almost identical. Actually, when we were having lunch, we were having a conference call in Mexico because our teams are uh, finalizing the details uh, for our air and uh, maritime manifests. These two manifests will be ready before the end of the year, um, or completely harmonized before the end of this year. Um, single entry will come later, uh, and perhaps in a year or so, we'll work on, on the single entry. And uh, Charlie already spoke about uh, the front of line privileges uh, for city pat and neck participants. I just wanted to mention something about infrastructure but because everybody has been talking about infrastructure today. In SAT and CBP uh, and other government agencies, we have also to balance infrastructure in, let's say, hours of service. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to say something that perhaps I'm not going to be the most popular guy. I'm not gonna be the happy Elizabeth Taylor after all this. But uh, what happened is this. Uh, honestly, we have on infrastructure at the border that is underutilized. Our ports of entry, we don't have a single port of entry that opens 24 hours a day for cargo. We just have, let's say, 16 hours or 14 hours. So. Investing in infrastructure is good. We are pro, uh, pro new infrastructure, modern infrastructure, but at the same time, we have to utilize that infrastructure we already have. This taxpayer's money has to be better utilized. It's very good news that, that CBP has now 2,000 new officers. Hopefully, SAT will have m more officers soon. And we can offer, again, because we tested 24-hour service about um, five, six years ago, and it didn't work. It didn't work because all the elements of the lo of logistic elements were not there, either the carriers or the brokers or the banks, whatever, not all the elements were there. So we are going to work uh, in parallel with expanding, accommodating, or adapting hours of service to provide a better service. And talk, talking to the, the trade community, because if you look at our graphs of the, the volumes, you look that uh, everything concentrates between 3 and 5 p.m. or 3 and 7 p.m. One more minute. Okay. This is the last one, city path and neck mutual recognition. This is fantastic. It's uh, uh, what we have. The, the Customs Trade Partnership Against Terrorism, which is the secure supply chain program of the United States, of CBP, and, and the Nuevo Esquema de Empresas Certificadas, which is the equivalent in Mexico. We signed a path towards mutual recognition just one year, uh, a year and a half ago. Actually, former Commissioner Aguilar, who was here. David, oh, David. <laughs> he signed this with uh, Mr. Aristoteles Nunez, uh, head of SAT, a year and a half ago. And well, we completed that plan, and uh, the mutual recognition agreement is about to be signed perhaps in August or September. This means also reduction of transactional costs because companies will be visited uh, jointly by CVP and SAT inspectors, and they don't have to 
process these two or go through these two different procedures, just one single procedure for the same company. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we've got another presentation. Yeah. And finally, Miguel Perez. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'll try to keep it short so we can have a question and answer session later at the end of the presentation. Um, my piece is to speak uh, about this topic from the logistical point of view. Uh, we know that commercial border crossings between the U.S. and Mexico by truck have been uh, taking place for many, many years, but have become more and more cumbersome uh, over time. With the increased constant threat of low contamination with uh, illegal immigrants, uh, substances, contraband, and more recently with national security threats. It has become an increased challenge that requires new ideas. Additional traffic through the Mexico-U.S. land ports has been growing constantly, and now that we have five different automotive companies either expanding or building new plants in Mexico, uh, is getting even worse. Now with the Eagle 4 shell uh, uh, development around Laredo, is also increasing as well. So we need to meet these challenges successfully with continuous improvement. Uh, that is a must. From the logistics uh, side, and hopefully everyone's, our mission needs to be to constantly try to figure out ways to make the border as seamless as possible to the users, the customers, etc., without, of course, sacrificing security and safety at the border. There are many different things that can be done and should be done. Uh, customers, manufacturers, need to have presence at the border, or at the very least periodically go and physically visit their border crossing service providers, locations, cross docks and warehouses, customs brokers, border crossing carriers, etc. For example, if you have a border crossing carrier that is doing 50 border crossings a day and he only has a uh, yard for, say, 20 or 40 trailer parking spaces, guess what? When custom systems goes down or there's a bomb threat or something happens at the border and the border shut down for a couple of hours, his trailers are being parked on the street. So out, goes the out the window goes his CTPAT certification because now you're, he's putting your load at risk. So uh, be there, look at your providers, see your customs brokers. Are they working from the garage of their house or it's a, a serious um, business? So it's highly recommendable that manufacturers or uh, shippers go actually to the border and visit uh, periodically. Shippers need to make sure that they run a secure place with secure standards, processes, and procedures, regardless of if they are in Mexico, U.S., or Canada. Most important, they need to make sure and document each and every load with accuracy, with an accuracy level of 99% plus, in order not to have the need for double handling, unloading, and auditing at the border. There's really no need when you hit the border to go to a warehouse, unload it, and check it if from the origin has been uh, declared uh, accurately. Over-the-road drivers need to make sure that the integrity of the load remains intact, that they run each route safely and on time and with the correct paperwork. Uh, one practice that we have uh, at the company I work for is that we have what we call the custody seal process. So every load that leaves a, at the origin in Mexico or the U.S., carries that extra piece of paper. And that paper says the trailer number, the load number, uh, the security seal number, and accompanies that driver all the way to the final destination. Um, in Mexico, as we know, there's a lot of, um, uh, we call them volantas, and it's military inspections that are checking for drugs. And sometimes they will break that seal. Uh, so if the driver takes the name or takes the kilometer where that was broken and, you know, takes the new number of seal that he's going to put on and he reports it to his base, then it will be a lot faster to uh, cross the border and it will also be a lot easier to find if there's any discrepancy on the load where it could have taken place. Uh, U.S. Customs needs to create flexibility when their work with their workforce to accommodate their resources efficiently as required during seasonal periods and or peak times during work hours. 
Um, with Gene Garza in Laredo, he used to tell me, well, you know, if, if I see that the line is getting to that sign over there in Nuevo Laredo, I open another lane. <coughs> and the GO, the Government Accountability Office, uh, asked, uh, I think recently, last year, well, what happens when the line hits a physical point that you cannot see? Um, and I think they're, they're working on that. And in Nuevo Laredo, in Mexico, uh, Alfredo Espinosa, the, um, the port director there, he, uh, in his administration, I think, they came up with uh, this idea. You, it shows actually the uh, export lot there in, in, on the right. Right there. And on each kilometer, he started placing cameras. So now you can go on the web and you can see how long the line is. And your customers can, can do that also remotely if they, you get access to this website. Here it tells you how many um, boots are open on the other side on the fast lane, uh, how long is the lane, and therefore, on average, it calculates how long is it going to take for you to cross. This is, this is the kind of benchmark. This is the kind of thing that, that we need at every port if we can. And, and Nuevo Laredo has it, uh, fortunately for us, where about 10,000 trucks cross per day over there. Um, Third-party logistics companies need to coordinate efficiently the efforts of everyone involved through their control tower initiatives and other innovative ideas of the sort. Some companies with mature supply chains and successful logistics planning initiatives can take two to four hours to perform a border crossing after arriving at the border. So like I was saying, if, if a, a load leaves from the Midwest and is accurately manifested, it can be electronically sent to the border the border, when they know, the driver can check with the geofences or with the radio, or with the phone, whatever, say, okay, I'm in San Antonio, I'm in Cotula. You can actually print the customs documentation right there and then and just get a hold of whatever border crossing driver you have from your company at uh, your site. In that way, when the load arrives, you just switch trucks, uh, do the CTPAT 17-point inspection, exchange doc, uh, documentation, give him the customs documentation, and it's on his merry way. So within two hours to four hours, it's, it's crossing the border. It's uh, totally unacceptable when sometimes uh, some companies take a day or two days to, to do that. Uh, border crossing carriers need and must meet, meet or exceed all CTPAT requirements. For example, CTPAT tells you, uh, you you should have closed caption TV cameras. That's the recommendation. But if you have a thorough process of in and out and, and, and going and checking around, they will still give you the CTPAT certification. But people need to understand that CTPAT requirements are the minimum uh, security requirements. So you need to always try to, to exceed them. Uh, you need to follow randomly the drivers. Um, uh, at our site, we put canine uh, dogs sniffing every load that comes in and goes out. We also do it once a day on the driver's uh, cars. We do it once a week on the, the work stations of the employees. I mean, you can never um, take enough precautions for that. So in summary, we need to understand that the work for an efficient border crossing does not start at the border. It starts at the shipping dock of every shipper or their suppliers, and everyone involved in the supply chain needs to work as a team and do their part properly. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much. Was, uh, I think we, we see how much goes into how many components there are to actually securing a supply chain and, and making a border crossing uh, function properly, and how many programs are now in place to try to make it that process more efficient. Uh, yet we also see that there are some challenges that still remain in making some of those things a reality and moving shipments as fast uh, as, as they can so that we have a border that's as competitive as possible. We have a time uh, to take a few questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw one in the mix, but maybe we can take a couple at a time and maybe do a two rounds, something like that. So we've got one question in the far back. We can uh, start with that one and then we'll grab uh, this one right here also. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd like to ask... Uh, and if you could please this, identify yourself, please. My name is Joe Harper. I'm from the city of San Luis, Arizona. And I would like to ask a question about private vehicles leaving, leaving the United States, going into Mexico. 
Uh, you have added some some uh, some stop lights and some stop bars in there, and this this is beginning to cause some problems on on the exit lanes. Is there anything that can be done to to alleviate that? Thanks very much for the question. Can we collect a couple of questions sure, and, sure. and do a round? So we've got this uh, gentleman right here, and then I'll get you next on the next round, Eric. This is, this is appropriate after his. Uh, Jason Walls, I represent 750 businesses at the world's busiest. Uh, I'm the head of the Chamber of Commerce in San Isidro, where we have no trucks. So uh, along with his question, I'm, I'm, really, I'm delighted to see the, we've heard all day about increased uh, relationships and, and participation and shared information between Mexico and the U.S. However, as we've also heard all day, we're undergoing in San Isidro the biggest uh, 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 reconfiguration in, in U.S. history. Um, and we're still talking about the implementation of southbound inspection booths. This is 50 yards ahead of Mexico's great new facilities at El Chaparral. And so I, not to be parochial, but whatever we do here, I'm sure is going to be coming soon to Texas or wherever else we're, we're expanding our, our ports of entry. Um, so, so the question is, uh, we've heard about uh, single point inspections, we've heard about shared information, yet we're still, as far as we've seen, GSA's plans still include southbound inspection booths. So we're building today for tomorrow, yet implementing systems from yesterday. I mean, we, we, we know that we're getting to a shared information point. Why would we then uh, put it, uh, spend millions on that kind of infrastructure? Thanks. So those are both actually southbound inspections questions. So let's grab Eric Lee's question from the back also. Two different components of it, but, but definitely similar issue. Right. Uh, thank you. Eric Lee, North American Research Partnership. Uh, my question is for Jose Martin Garcia. Um, you mentioned that uh, according to uh, SATS modeling or, or how your agency looks at border infrastructure, we're actually underutilizing uh, the existing border infrastructure. I think that is a key point because that goes directly against uh, or it, it's seemingly contrary to uh, what the border communities, at least on the U.S. side, uh, are talking about in terms of uh, infrastructure deficits uh, as well as uh, staffing problems. So I wondered if you could go into that uh, a little bit more. It's a very interesting point. Thanks. And I'm going to just take the moderator's privilege to throw one last question. This is a little broader question on the table, but I, I really just want us to think forward. What, what's the long-term goal? I mean, what is an ideal border crossing system look like to you? So if you, as a, you know, an importer, exporter, you know, how, how should we be, what should we be moving towards so that we're, we're heading towards an ideal where we have a really efficient process? What, what does that look like to, to any of you that want to take that challenge and try to answer that question? Who would like to answer first? Would well, you like to start? Well, I, I, will, I will take that and, and uh, give you a general answer. First of all, it, it depends. First of all, if, if we're talking about trading, if we're talking trade uh, mechanisms, which is most of what, uh, what Miguel was, uh, was addressing, then it is the early information. It's advanced information. If we can um, get advanced information on, on aircraft cargo systems and, and check them uh, to be able to actually identify printer cartridges, cartridge bombs by shared information with, uh, with uh, the Middle, Middle Eastern uh, partners and with the UK, we can do the same thing with trucks in Mexico and, and the U.S., northbound, southbound. So it's about advanced information. It's about these the things that we're talking about, single window and, and shared information where the electrons are being passed and not a piece of paper that's going from booth to booth. Uh, so that's the ideal situation. It is where you get the information. Uh, right now, if, if Toyota uh, is sending vehicles, they, they send them uh, through their own shipping, but before a, a vehicle goes on to their, their vessel, we already know what the VIN is, we know what every option is there, we know what color it is, we know how many lug nuts it has, we, have, we know everything about it before it gets on the boat coming this way. So it's the same thing, so we can trust it. So that's what the process is. Security and, and, and facilitation can be the same thing if you comply, if you have compliance, if, we, if you know what the requirements are, you do those requirements, you share the information, then it's known. If I know what something is, then I know how to evaluate its risks, and we will uh, take our limited resources for inspection and apply them where they need to be, at the highest risk points, uh, and where there is 
a trusted relationship, then there's going to be as fast as you can get it through whatever maze is there. And that's why we're putting fast lanes and other expedited lanes so that all we're doing is checking to make sure that the driver, the vehicle, and whatever it is they're carrying is what we know it should be and only spot check those other pieces. And any comments on southbound inspection? Southbound inspection, you're talking uh, something a little bit different now. Um, uh, customs to me is a, is a two-way street. It is the inbound and the outbound from a U.S. perspective. So for years, we have allowed everything to flow south without much of anything unless a uh, LAPD or, or San Diego was chasing somebody. Um, and there it was hard to even muster up enough to get out there in front of it and, and effectively stop it. So um, what is going with southbound, what we have found is that uh, a whole lot of money, uh, uh, billions of dollars are missing from the U.S. circulation uh, that end up paying for illicit um, activities south of the border or elsewhere in the world, and much of it is traveling in vehicles, trucks, etc., going south. Okay, it is not a trusted trader uh, mechanism. It is not that you're with San Isidro. You're not talking about uh, you're talking about travel, and you're talking about the highest risk thing there is. The highest risk um, transaction in cargo is household goods coming from someplace to to the United States. Highest risk. Why? Do not necessarily know who it is that's shipping it don't know what's inside other than what they've told us, don't know who they are, and many times the address they give us where, where it is going is fraudulent. Or the, the people they're going to work for when we check with them uh, either don't exist, don't have that person hired, etc. So it is about the transaction. It is about the mechanism. So if it is vehicles, uh, you know, I, I think San Isidro has a lot of vehicles, and a lot of people that cross the, cross the line uh, going both ways every day. It is a very high risk if you have indications that, um, that uh, there may be illicit activity going southbound. We have gotten weapons, ammo, um, and lots of money going southbound. That's what's funding those lanes. Um, and until we can figure out a way and a mechanism, and we do have with trusted traveler mechanisms, there'll be trusted lanes where people go through that that we know what they're doing or, or uh, have given us all their information. So those are the dynamics that we're dealing with. Uh, it's not a perfect system, but we have to, where we know that there's a problem, we have to address it. It's part of the security and mechanisms. Thank you. Mr. Martin? Yes, uh, on the first question, um, the, the process for, every, for any vehicle uh, moving southbound, it takes seven seconds, it basically, or well, between six and eight seconds. The, the locations where we where we have these congestions is not because of the time we take in the process. You know, we, we, the vehicles go through this lane. Uh, our license plate reader systems read the plates. Go, the vehicle goes through a complete risk management and targeting process, and then we select which vehicles are sent to secondary inspection. That all is done in seven seconds. What we uh, when we have these congestions, and, and let me give you an example of how things are moving so fast, for example, in Chaparral. No? But if you look at Otay, which is just uh, five miles east of Chaparral, we only have four lanes there. And, and that is a, an infrastructure issue, for example. It's not uh, that the system takes so long. We will continue reading the plays. Uh, we will continue in, in implementing these systems because it only takes seven seconds per vehicle. And uh, where we can expand the, uh, the infrastructure to have more lanes so that there are no discontinuities, we will do it. And that's, for example, that let, let me just skip the second question and move to the third question, which was the uh, infrastructure. Uh, I hope uh, I'm not misinterpreted here, because why I'm, uh, what, I'm, what I said is that, yes, look at Nuevo Laredo, for example, or look at Otay. Uh, we have big facilities, large facilities there for both import and export, but, but we are only open from 8 a.m. to uh, 10 p.m., let's say. And um, so we have these hours that where we don't have service for cargo. I'm talking about cargo. When you look at the U.S.-Canada border, there are several locations where they have 24-7 service for cargo, but not on the U.S.-Mexico border. So in order to u utilize our, our current infrastructure to its 
highest level of service, we should look at this. Okay, this doesn't. It is not against the idea of building new infrastructure. We need new infrastructure, and we will build new infrastructure. But we, at the same time, we have to. In the meantime, we have to utilize the current infrastructure uh, the best we can. Okay. Let me touch on that just a little bit. Um, several years ago, and I saw uh, Mr. Aguilar here just a few minutes ago. I don't see him now. Former uh, Commissioner Aguilar. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Aguilar, uh, about two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago, said, hey, look, we're going to do some, we're going to open up. We want to open up the northbound, open it up. We want, uh, we want the lanes open. We're going to open up first, you know, first light or as early in the morning as possible, and we'll keep them open late. What happened was they didn't use them. Yeah. They didn't use them. So we did that, and it wasn't about infrastructure. It was about manning, and we manned them. And after a while, just didn't come. Everybody wanted to come at the same time. We piloted right. at four locations, actually, yeah. uh, Otay, um, El Paso, uh, Laredo, and uh, FAR, and it didn't work. didn't work. So, um, you know, you need to spread the, you got to spread the traffic out, and again, it's about a partnership, and private sector needs to, to partner with us. If we're going to put the people on the line, Got it. You know, it's up to them not to sit there and, and run their machines, and everybody comes at eight o'clock, and then at twelve o'clock there's nothing. So, Miguel, <laughs> tell, when, tell us how we can make were, that work. That type of a partnership. When you were asking uh, the question about how would the perfect uh, border crossing would look like, uh, a lot of things came to mind. And now that the Charles was bringing this up, and, and Jose, uh, unfortunately, when when this twenty-four hour pilot program. Uh, took place was at the worst time in Juarez. I mean, the killings were like crazy. The violence was crazy. Right now, thank God, it has turned 180 degrees and it's getting a lot better. But you see, if I'm hauling a, a, a customer's load full of laptops, I'm not going to send it at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? So uh, what I was thinking it was, okay, we have uh, we, we try to replicate what our airports do with a control tower. So we have a control tower in Detroit or in Laredo or what have you, and we are looking at this whole supply chain from the customer, and we have um, schedules, dock schedules, uh, outbound schedules, inbound schedules, and so on. So in, in, ideally, the, the forklift operator is right at the dock, just, you know, he knows that at 1.30, there's the screen. You know, this load, uh, this truck is going to come with this load and it needs to be transloaded to this other truck and the other half needs to go to the other truck. And you, you, you know that the load departed the Midwest on time, so it should be here at this time, plus minus 15 minutes. The load uh, comes in, the paperwork is already done, you just switch the load where it needs to go, uh, you do an audit, you close the doors and off it goes. So on the Mexican side, in Aguascalientes, they have an internal uh, customs. So once it leaves there, it doesn't have to stop. It just boom, just breezes through, it goes. Uh, if customs must have a proof that the truck didn't take more than what it should have taken or, or so on, they can have access to the GPS system, you can have geofences so they know when it's, when it's uh, going, and you can randomly stop one truck or two trucks every 10 just to make sure that, that there's no hanky-panky going on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. If, yeah. Just, if I may, on, on, on the future, just to, to add to that, uh, to all the good points that, that Charlie made. But uh, today, 41% of Mexican exports to the U.S. are moved, uh, are city pad exports, and not moved through these fast lanes. That accounts more uh, than what the U.S. imports, let's say, from Germany, or from the U.K., France, and Italy combined. So Mexico is, is sending to the U.S. Uh, in a very secure and efficient way these, these volumes, okay? Now, what, in order to achieve that model of, of perfect port of entry, we have to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. If you look at every piece, cargo pre-inspection, fast lanes, the mutual recognition, the single window. It's, so we'll get to that point where at, by putting all these pieces together, we can certainly move a truck from Aguascalientes to Kansas City 
with minimum stops and or or a train without stopping at the border the non intrusive inspection systems or the geo uh, special no locators all those pieces have to be put together, and this is our challenge for the next years. Absolutely. So a border without stops, that's where we're headed. Keep, keep them to it. Uh, thank you all very much for taking the time to talk to us today. It's been very fascinating. Uh, give me a hand. Thank you. We are actually going to move straight into our next panel. I know we're, uh, we're uh, taskmasters, we're slave masters here, uh, whipping the whip, but we're going to keep going. If somebody needs to step out, we understand for a second, uh, but we're actually just going to bring the next panel right up and keep the program rolling along. Thanks a lot.